Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time, back with episode number two with the one and only Mr. Jonathan Twomley. How you doing, sir? Uh, I'm doing great, Michael. So good to be back after a pretty long hiatus. Yeah, right? it was a couple, two, three weeks. We both had vacations yeah. and you were doing deal stuff, so it was all good. So video number one, we talked about the Fed meeting. We kind of just broke it down macro. Now I want to kind of bring it back and talk about some uh, an opinion that I've changed since Friday. So this has been less than a week. I now believe, Jonathan, that we are... Um, on an accelerated path, at least for residential financing to 7% 30-year fixed, best credit, real down payment borrowers, which means investors in residential might be in the eights, high sevens, eights. And what I wanted to do with you, uh, because I don't generally play in the larger multifamily stuff, is say, hey, if we've got 7% 30-year money resi, residential, what does that mean for your world? Because again, commercial is different financing. What might rates go to and would it be high enough to kind of shake the market up? Because I think in residential, we saw the market grind to a halt at six in June. Rates went down to five. It kind of got better. Sorry, folks, we're going to seven by the end of the year or you know January at latest. So that's a lot. But yeah, I do, I do not have a good feeling about rates. I think it's going much, much higher. Well, listen, so there are, there are two different effects that rising interest rates will have on multifamily. Okay. One good and one bad. Okay. So the the bad one will be on pricing, obviously. If interest rates go up, it just means that your uh, you know, how much money the bank is going to give you is going to drop. Mm -hmm. And that's going to affect the pricing of multifamily. Now, if you're a buyer, that's great, right? You know, I mean, you just listen, if you're a buyer, like Higher interest rates, just a function of underwriting, right? Yeah. You just I, adjust your right underwriting. Too. Like you don't, yeah. you don't really I don't care. Really care. I don't care if it's 10% cost yeah. of capital. It's one variable on a spreadsheet. Right. You're just going to offer less. Now, there will, there may be a time when there, you can't have a meeting of the minds between sure. sellers and buyers because sellers may be locked into higher interest rates. You know, They may have an issue uh, mm -hmm. with how much they can get on the market uh, and they can't sell. Um at, at that new price. I mean, we've seen that happen before. Mm -hmm. They also just may, may, you know, just like pull it off the market in the last yeah. section. Well, yeah, they may pull, pull it off the market and just try to refi and hang on until the market comes, you know, till they, till they grow their way mm -hmm. into a higher price again. Um, or, you know, they may engage in wishful thinking like wall street and, mm -hmm. and say that, you know, the fed is going to lower rates again yeah. and then, and then prices will go up. Uh, so lots of things could happen on the seller side that would pre prevent, um, you know, buyers from being able to buy at better uh, prices. But mm -hmm. at, at some point, the market will reach a new equi equilibrium yeah, at, at higher interest rates. And, uh, you know, we back towards more something that's historically normal. Um, but if you're a seller, I mean, listen, if you're a seller or you have to refinance, if you had uh, bridge debt and you didn't mm. buy a rate, you didn't buy a rate cap, you know, um, it, if you uh, you might just have your your expectations unsettled with your investors, you know, if your timing is bad for you with all of this, mm -hmm. right, uh, it, it could be a problem. I mean, if you if you went into a deal last year, and frankly, even if you had like five percent bridge, you know, a five year bridge loan, and you had and you bought a rate cap, right? Well, listen, you've four years from now, things will probably be okay. Right. right. The right. the real issue is for people who have, you know, bridge debt or potentially even regular debt maturing in the next year. Right. right? And and that nobody underwrote these higher interest rates. Right. Mm -hmm. And even though I was screaming at people for for years that they should not be under that they should be underwriting much higher cap rates on their exit mm -hmm. to make sure that they can survive much higher cap rates on the exit mm -hmm. people were telling me i was a fool because interest rates are going to stay low and therefore cap rates are going to stay low forever yeah. that that may have been true but as a matter of being conservative you still want to know what's going to happen during that unexpected event right mm -hmm. and so but a lot of a lot of people have blinders on and they don't like to think about the unexpected event because it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable. So the, uh, so the one, the one question I had for you, sorry to cut you off is yeah. if residential financing 30 years, 7%, what is that kind of, I mean, is there is commercial debt doesn't have to be 7%. It might no, be something lower. No, it'll be, it, it's, it really depends on what the, uh, what the treasury bill is because the 10 year or two, the, year? Ten, the 10 year. 
So well, let's whatever, say whatever, whatever. Well, it depends on whatever the term of your loan is, right? Okay. So if, if you're getting a five-year loan, it's going to be keyed off the five-year treasury. If it's going okay. to be a 10-year loan, the 10-year treasury. So let so, me pay. This is what I see coming and you can react from here. Yeah. I see the Fed funds rate going to four or four and a quarter uh, January, February of next year. I believe if the if, if let's call it four and a quarter for the worst case scenario, I suspect the 10 years got to be five and a half, five and three quarters. Well, if that so if that happens, then, yeah, you could you could because usually you're looking at anywhere from, uh, you know, 150 to 200 basis points, you know, spread between right. that's what between I was the Treasury and what they're lending at. That's right? what I was thinking. Yeah. So. um but it really depends, you know, what it is. If it's also, if it's based on sulfur, I mean, I don't know how the sulfur rate is affected. The sulfur rate is still very low. It is still the spread low, over, yeah. the, the spread over sulfur is is the 200 basis points, but the, you know, the loans are still quite uh, quite low if it's if it's off sulfur. So so it really depends. Um, Tell people what sulfur is. That's a new vocabulary for them. Yes, yeah, sulfur is the thing that replaced LIBOR, Correct. which was the... I always forget what LIBOR stands for, but it's a, it's a London international yeah, banking so, something. Yeah. yeah overnight so rate. For, yeah. Overnight rate. Yeah. And so for is sort of similar, but different and it's very complicated and has, it's sort of how they, how they determine interest rates in, in Europe. And so some banks use that. And mm. so, um, but in, in any event, uh, it, it so for tends to be cheaper than the treasury uh, okay. from what I understand. Um, but anyway, the don't quote me on that. But no, um, yeah. the uh, but the way that the rates are calculated basically is off of whatever the whatever the banks are borrowing at because the banks are not using their own money for these loans, right? The right. banks are borrowing from somewhere and then they're lending you the money, so they have to build in a spread, and so that spread is typically, uh, you know typically in the sort of 150 to 200 basis point range, it could go lower. I mean, if the banks suddenly have no business at all, they may, they may lower that spread. So at least they can make some money. Yeah. Right? It's funny because I think it's going to be a combination. So I, I do see potentially margin spread collapse, but on the, at the same time, Jonathan, I think they're going to lower LTV, right? If they're going to, if they're usually doing well, 65, then they do because the economy, I think is going to be softer. Well, they, this. they don't, really at least in my experience don't lower mm -hmm. ltv based on okay uh the economy like some outlook of the economy they the ltv is a is a deter, is a function of your debt service coverage ratio okay right DSR, so and that's okay. based on they're going to be looking at the historical three month trailing operating statement to see okay. where you are okay. and so they're they're typically looking at that to see what your likely rents are what your likely noi is and then they have a you know 1.25x debt service coverage ratio that they're going to apply to that and whatever that spits out uh as like the amount of debt they can give you is what will determine how much proceeds you can get okay right so um and then that in turn will affect the price so if they're if you're if the you know what's what's been happening recently is that be, because interest rates have gone up Right, the debt service coverage nut has gone up. Correct. Right, and so there are a lot of people who are in deals that they agreed to at X price, and then interest rates went up, and literally the bank is like, "We can't give you seventy five percent of that price anymore. Mm -hmm. We right. can only give you sixty five percent of that price." Now right. the the buyers are going to the sellers and saying, "Hey, look, we got less proceeds. You got to lower the price." And 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 look, seller, everyone else is in the same boat. It's not mm -hmm. like there's some secret interest rate out there. We're all in the same boat. So you can go back to market if you want to, but right. good luck getting your old price. Um, and then it's it's basically, you know, like who who feel what who feels what's riskier, right? Mm -hmm. But um so that that will affect the amount of proceeds you get. But okay. I want to just shift gears to the other the flip side of this, which it's kind of may ameliorate things. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If interest rates for single family homes go up that much, mm -hmm. right? What's gonna happen is a lot of people are gonna rent. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. So that then changes the equation a little bit in the favor of multifamily, where if more people have to rent, uh, then rents will continue to rise. And if rents are rising, then your NOI goes up and then you can get more proceeds, right? I mean, you can mm -hmm. pay your debt service. So it, it's it's kind of like 
which which effect is going to be greater faster we just really don't know they're both operating at the same time so it's a little bit of a juggling mm -hmm. act right and then the other of course the other factor in all this is this is also a function of supply and demand right, right. so uh if there's enough apartments being built then uh you won't see rents going up uh, as much because there's more supply in the market but if you're in a you know constrained market you'll see rents skyrocketing right because of people not being able to buy houses and mm -hmm. what what we have i read recently that you know they've been talking for years and years and years about it the housing shortage the housing shortage the housing shortage and yeah there is a housing shortage but multifamily starts are basically at like the highest level since like the 70s right mm -hmm. right yeah. now i mean mm -hmm. it's taken a long time for them to catch up but now it's it's catching up and the way that the industry works though it's not like those housing starts those multifamily housing starts are e equally distributed throughout the country no, or, or they're distributed in, in proportion to the population they're all running in the same place they're all going to what's perceived as safe which is where all where most of the population growth is so you have a lot of concentration of housing starts in the same area so you're more likely to wind up with softening rents in places where everybody is building and those are you know kind of you can imagine what markets those are mm -hmm. but it's uh you know so then the question is going to be is the population growth going to keep up with the building or is the building going to get out ahead of the population growth but i think what you definitely will see it's hard to predict that you know so whether in a place like dallas you know what, what is population growth going to exceed building or the other way around uh you know who knows uh, and that'll also depend on the economy because if the economy gets bad then people don't move mm -hmm. right so that's there's all those factors but what what is, is certain to be the case is that in places like california and new york where it is very hard to build you're going to see rents going up yeah, because because so. because supply will continue to be constrained what gets built will be on the upper end of the market um mm -hmm. in terms of like condos and etc um and the rents for everybody else, you know, it, they're they're gonna uh, yeah. continue to rise. And yeah, I think got... that, I think that makes total sense. I and I kind of would have would have gone there. I th I think seven percent more. We already know what happens at six. You and I talked about months ago, like kind of the market. We talked about deals being retraded and deals backing out. People giving up earnest money. I think we could be on a very fast path to seven. Uh, I think residential is going to really suffer. Um, I think the Fed broke housing, as I've said many times. I think what's going to surprise a lot of people is how much supply destruction. There's a lot of people that would like to sell their home yeah. that are simply not going to because they don't get the price they want or probably more likely they can't afford the next purchase, right? If you're in a house today at 3% and the next house is at 7 well, that's uncomfortable. And listen, I mean, what do we... What about people who will be underwater as well? I mean, you know, there are going to be people who are going to be underwater sure. because the, you know, the price of their house is going to decline. And I think mm -hmm. it's going to be in some of the usual suspects as, you know, Phoenix, probably, Vegas, Boise. Yeah, you can yeah. predict the markets where this is going to happen, where yeah. it's, you know, the whole economy is based on building houses mm -hmm. and people moving there. And like, you know, once that stops, then you, you got, got it. you got issues, right? So mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going to be very interesting. I think, I, again, I don't see, I think, uh, I think residential, residential housing market is going to be in a depression if it's not already. I think transactions for new construction and existing go down 50% peak to trough sometime next year. Uh, I do think 2024 will be better. I think we've got to get through the pain. I do. I am going to believe Jerome Powell until he proves otherwise that he's just going to hold the line, no cuts. Uh, but you know, there will be cuts eventually. 2024, 2025, probably 2024, but yeah, it's, um, rates are going up. So, uh, everybody should, uh, act accordingly. In my opinion, Jonathan, where can people find you? Yeah. So if you would like to invest with me, please Google two bridges, asset management, LLC, and fill out the investor formula find on the website. And if you would like to join my free Facebook group, it is called the multifamily investment community on Facebook. Uh, and, if you would like to learn from me, you can go to multifamilylaunchpad.org and you can see the programs I have on offer and get a free download there as well. Yeah, folks, this free download is amazing. Uh, we went over it the other day. Um, 
Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome stuff. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. Mm-hmm.